you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm Catherine Algor. I'm the president here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And it's especially gratifying to see you because it's such a lovely evening out. I'm glad you took time to come and um, attend this program, but it will totally be worth missing the sunshine. It's also a pleasure to see some new faces in the audience. For those of you who may be visiting us here at the Historical Society for the first time, we are an independent nonprofit organization. We have an amazing research library with over 13 million manuscripts, and that includes the personal papers of three U.S. presidents, um, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and half of Thomas Jefferson. Um, but in addition to holding the papers of presidents and senators, our collection has great depth and includes the voices of men, women, children of all races and classes, both the famous and the obscure. For example, our current exhibit, Fashioning the New England Family, explores clothing that runs the gamut from homespun checkered cotton cloth to waistcoats worn in the halls of power. I hope you had a chance to go up and see the show. It's only up for another week and a half, um, and this is the last program we're hosting to highlight that show, so there's still a little time left. So tonight we will have, I'm just saying, the great program and very appropriate finale to this wonderful exhibition. The panel will be the first in an annual lecture series exploring material culture in honor of President Emeritus Dennis Fiore in recognition of his leadership and his own scholarly passions. The program will explore the history of reuse and refashioning, as well as how designers today are using secondhand clothing or previously disposed of material in new ways. Our discussion will be led by our guest curator, Kimberly Alexander. Um, Dr. Alexander is a lecturer in museum studies in the history department at the University of New Hampshire, as well as an independent museum professional and author. She was also, may I say, the perfect example of the perfect guest curator. She received her PhD in art history from Boston University and her BA in history from Colby College. Um, she will introduce the other panelists, but before we begin, please join me in thanking Kimberly for all of her work in our exhibition and the supporting programs. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Catherine. Every, uh, every time I walk through these front doors, uh, it's always a wonderful experience. Um, it's good to look out at all of you tonight. Many of you have become regulars at these events. I feel like I know some of you. Uh, and so it's uh, both wonderful to see you again, but also a little sad that this is our last program. However, I'm incredibly excited about the panel that we have uh, to share with you today, to share their ideas with you. Lindsay is a professor at Stonehill College, where she specializes in United States history between the American Revolution and the Civil War. Her research focuses on consumer and material culture and the intersection of fashion and capitalism in the early republic. She consults with museums and historic homes, such as Mount Vernon, to interpret the period of the nation's founding. She is working on a book that explores science, gender, and the struggles of women to gain acceptance at Harvard University. I'm very much looking forward to this. She serves on the standing committees of the American Studies and Gender Studies uh, program and is program director for Gen Gender and Sexuality Studies. She received her PhD and MA from Harvard University and her BA from Mount Holyoke. Uh, we also have tonight speaking with us uh, Jay Calder, who is author of Form Fit Fashion, about which the LA Times uh, said, and I quote, a new fashion Bible for designers, aspirers, and the just plain curious. This tome contains all the secrets. He may share some of those with us tonight. His second book, Fashion, Fashion Design Essentials, was published in 2011. Uh, Jay is, uh, is the founder of the now very well-known Boston Fashion Week, the organization's executive director since 1995. In 2012, he was appointed creative director of the first Shenzhou Fashion Week in China. His work as a fashion designer has graced the pages of Vogue and Elle magazines, and he's held the office of regional director of the Fashion Group International of Boston from 2009 to 2010. He's an instructor and the director of creative marketing at School of Fashion Design here in Boston. He is also teaches at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. 
Um, I'd also like uh, next to introduce Michelle Tallini Finnamore. Um, and before I uh, go into uh, a long list of, of Michelle's uh, credentials, I want to let everyone in the audience know that her exhibition, Gender Bending Fashion, has just opened at the Museum of Fine Arts. And I strongly encourage you to go see this exhibit. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, milestone in how we approach all of the topics that we're going to be looking at this evening. Michelle is the Penny Vink Curator of Fashion Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Her books, and they are numerous, uh, include um, Hollywood Before Glamour, Fashion in American Silent Film, and she was co-author of Jewelry by Artists in the Studio, 1940 to 2000. She has taught courses on fashion, design, and film history at the Rhode Island School of Design and the Massachusetts College of Art, and previously held posts at the Costume Institute at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Sotheby's Auction House. She is curated at the MFA, Textile, Hollywood Glamour, Fashion and Jewelry, from the silver screen, and Think Pink, which I'm sure many of you remember. Also Cocktail Culture uh, at the Norton Museum of Art, Driving Fashion, Automobile Upholstery from the 1950s at the Museum at Fit, and has assisted with Jackie Kennedy the White House years at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She received her PhD at the Bard Graduate Center in New York, and then finally, our final panel member uh, is, is Pete Langford. I have a, an anecdote I'd like to share uh, before I, I introduce Pete uh, formally, which is we actually met through our children who were taking a Spanish language class. And as you do with children, we were waiting uh, in the lobby and we started talking and he mentioned that he was at Timberland and he was doing some really, what I thought was really interesting work in terms of, uh, of thinking about shoe and boot design. And I thought, oh, well, I'm writing a book on shoes. Surely we have lots to talk about. <laughs> but so this is, as we all know, when you have children and dogs, that you can often make these con connections. And, and so tonight, I'm very glad to say that Pete has agreed to, to join us. Uh, he is the design director for Timberland Boot Company. Um, he has been designing footwear since 1993. And in that time, he has moved from being a small startup firm through Converse and then to Timberland, where he's been since 1998. Throughout this time, Langford has been interested in hard science-based research, focusing on the precise biomechanical tweaks that make for a better shoe. And I'm sure we all can appreciate that. So right now, I'm probably a pretty lousy moderator because uh, I'm, I, I'm colleagues with everybody here on the, on the dais and I love listening to them so it's going to be a little challenging but I'll, I'll absolutely do my best. Um, I'd like to start off with Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay, could you reflect on the history of reuse and fashioning, how this has been done in the past and how this is reflected in collections or not today? Sure, so I thought since I was going first that we would, I would lay out some conceptual frameworks um, and questions through which we could consider these particular topics on the history and future of reusing, recycling, and refashioning. And I define um, garments as all that is worn. The term fashion, you might be interested to learn, evolved from the Latin fascium or way to faison in English in the 14th century influenced heavily by the French word fair to make. So that the term fashion by the early modern period came to mean a way of making and a way of being. And I think this more kind of capacious definition begs us to broaden the scope of the actions, styles, and objects that we consider when we talk about fashion. Fashion in my field in history has suffered a great deal from a reflexive association with the style of metropolitan elites. And you can see those metropolitan elites on, in the lovely oil portraits adorning the Massachusetts Historical Society. So there's been this preoccupation with the ways in which various groups imitated high fashion. Um, I argue everyone from enslaved African laborers who whittled out clay, uh, whittled out bones and shells to make buttons. 
uh, working class Bowery boys in New York who took pride at the first um, secondhand coat they ever wore, um, to native Sioux on the plains who eagerly adopted imported Mexican blankets in bright hues of red and blue to express and maintain uh, community and culture. All of these objects are ways of making and ways of being. So that rather than cordon off certain styles as material culture and other styles like Spitalfield silk or a Charles Worth gown as fashion, I think it's important that we see them all in the same field of vision and explore the range of meanings that people uh, have used fashion historically and presently to convey. Indeed, certainly these meanings often collide with one another and vie for preeminence and authority. A 19th century Charles Worth gown on a freed woman's body, on a laboring woman's body, hiked up above the ankles with red shoes and a daring sash, is not the same object. The act of defining and arbitrating what is fashionable is a political and social struggle for power waged on and through the body. So similarly for me, the meaning of reusing and recycling clothes lies at the interstices of matrices of privilege and power. Throughout early American history, the reuse, the recycling, the remaking of garment was associated with Puritan thrift and economy. And bromides and Puritan newspapers upheld the thrifty colonial housewife who, rather than like a fashionable dilettante, bought this year's Spitalfield silk, refashioned her mother's garment into something new. That instantiates a certain valence of what thrift and economy is that's simply not available and doesn't mean the same thing on, say, the young working class women from rural New Hampshire and Vermont who flooded to the textile mills of Lowell because they had only ever worn and lived in secondhand clothing. They wrote beautiful, deeply poignant letters about what it meant on a laboring woman's body who stood at a mill 14 hours a day to purchase something new with her own money. The only new thing she might ever acquire was in those years that she worked to labor for herself. Similarly, I think a, a lot about um, enslaved uh, laborers at, at Monticello, um, at various plantation sites, who in the hours after laboring from dawn until dusk, raised chickens, kept a garden plot, uh, caught fish, made art, and sold the proceeds to whites to have a little bit of their own cash so that, in, in the words of one diarist from Virginia, he might buy his sweetheart a gown. When we think about reuse and recycling in, the, in our 21st century obsession with a Green New Deal and with eco-fashion, I want us to be careful that reusing and recycling doesn't become another instantiation of white privilege and power, and that we forget the meaning that new things have on different bodies, bodies positioned differently vis-a-vis -vis fashion's matrix of power. So while it's absolutely important that we combat global climate change and that we consider that 11 million tons of textiles end up in a landfill annually. Uh, before we rush to shop at Patagonia, which has, which has adopted, and Hannah Anderson, which have adopted these closed loop systems so that when you buy from there, you can recycle and return to those stores. New York City has initiated an important municipal effort to recycle textiles. Um, I think a lot about the contested meaning of things and their newness and their relationship to a fashion system for those for whom it remains a crucial symbol of power and belonging. Um, and with every good intention, reusing and recycling must not just become another mechanism for white bourgeois virtue signaling. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, Jay, I'd like to move on with a question for you. Um, you are surrounded by new and innovative ideas every day, being in the, uh, working with so many students and young people in particular. Could you share some of the exciting examples you've seen of reuse and recycling currently? Um, what innovative designs have you seen? And what would you like to see more of, perhaps in the future? Okay. 
Okay. Um, well, when I first was started to think about the question, um, I tried to think of it from my students' point of view and what would get them excited. And also, I wanted to set a little bit of a challenge for myself because I felt like, you know, when you create presentations for students, they kind of last a while, you know, from semester to semester. I try to refresh them as much as I can. So my big challenge for coming up with imagery for today was to uh, find new, new designers, basically, that I was excited about that I didn't know about before. So um, I think we're all set up. So um, I, I started to look for, uh, for them, and I wanted to find ways that they were different. Because I think when we talk about sustainability and reusing, um, it all, all kind of gets lumped together. And I think uh, part of what's going to make uh, sort of make it a part of the culture of fashion is the thinking, changing the thinking, and, um, and really thinking about how to approach this issue in a way that's authentic to the, the, the person who is designing and the, the, co the companies that are they're working with it. So um, here uh, behind me, uh, this is the name of the first designer, um, Echo Alf, and they're from Spain. And I hashtagged it, it's recycle. And they really uh, recycle in terms of the fact that they uh, work with uh, a lot of the waste found in the ocean. This is just a pretty close up of the detail. Um, and I wanted to start off with this because of the fact that um, uh, good intentions are, are great, uh, but if it's not attractive, if it doesn't feel like fashion, if it doesn't feel like something that uh, someone can express themselves in, it's just not going to click. Uh, we found that with organics, you know, a lot, the limited range in the beginning of organic fabrics and things like that was keeping the sales down. You know, it was too expensive and then it just wasn't pretty enough. So, uh, so I, I mean, this was, I love this detail. It was actually a, a collaboration between the designer and uh, Sibylla. So uh, this is a jacket. It's really beautiful. And it's outerwear, so it's actually practical. Um, one of the things that I, one of the reasons I chose this particular designer was because of the fact that it was performance fabric. You know, it was uh, water resistant, it was a raincoat. And then you see a couple of other versions of, you know, of, uh, I mean, a, a couple of other styles by that, uh, from that collaboration. And you definitely see fashion, you know, but uh, the idea that they're wearing fishnets, like actual nets and plastics that have been recycled um, and turned into these fabrics. So this is recycling, you know, at its purest in the sense that we are really taking waste breaking it down and building something completely new, a new textile that has performance uh, uh, qualities. So th then I went on and I thought, okay, my fashion students are going to want high fashion. So the idea of haute couture and you know, working at that level. And uh, Maison Margiela is one of my favorite houses to begin with, but then the artisanal collection takes it a whole other place because it's not only um, refashioning things, but it's also uh, really pushing the envelope in terms of the art of fashion. So here is uh, from, I believe, their most recent collection. And these are all basically repurposed um, textiles and fabrics from garments. And then you hear, this is a runway. And if you look carefully, you just kind of see the piecework, almost real pretty Frankenstein combination, you know, just like building building the new monster, so to speak, of fashion, but in all different creative ways, taking inspiration from, from the, the different materials. Um, the next designer, um, uh, Bungard Nielsen, uh, from Denmark, from Copenhagen, um, it, uh, her approach, one of, one of her approaches, because she does several things, is to rethink the system. And uh, the dress I'm gonna show you next, uh, a couple of features have to do with sizing and being able to control the fit of the garment because she felt that a lot of um, waste had to do with garments, uh, n n the fit changing, not fitting well and that kind of thing. So they were very, things become disposable when they don't fit well. And even to the point, uh, and also um, including things like pads for the, um, for the armholes that can be removed uh, for sweat and staining so that you uh, launder the garment less. You just launder the pads. And this is the, the, the sample garment, the circle dress. And then here you see a lot of variations. And a, a lot of it also allows for modifications, the removal of the sleeve and, um, and changing of the fit of the garment. Next, I found Recode. And 
along the lines of recycling and refashioning, um, they're from Korea, I thought remaking. Because um, I, in their garments, you can really see um, traces of the original garment. So it's kind of just re remaking it, breaking it apart, and thinking about deconstruction and reconstruction. Here's an example. And you can see the elements of the trace garments, but everything looks very fresh and modern. And that's actually one of my favorites. I wish I could get away with wearing that. It's really cool. I love those pockets. Um, and then we have the uniform project. Um, uh, this one is uh, uh, Sheena took one dress and she wore it for 365 days. And um, she had a blog and she posted about all the different ways she styled the dress. Now she had multiple dresses just for, for laundry purposes, but it was the same exact dress. And the point she was trying to make is reuse, like rethink. And also for me, it was really a matter of revaluing, like seeing the value in the garment you, you bought and um, thinking like a lot, of, a lot of people want to think about, uh, you know, I always hear when I, when I walk into a room and I say I work in fashion, it's amazing how many people tell me they're a stylist. <laughs> And, and what we need to remember is that we're all stylists in a way when we get dressed in the morning. And this was just such a great example of it. And here are just a few examples of the way she wore it because the dress was fashioned in such a way it could be worn as a jacket, it could be worn under things, over things. And this is just a small sample. She actually did it for 365 days. And then I believe her second project um, after that was based on the little black dress concept. Then we have Bethany Williams, and this from the UK about repurposing. And one of the things I loved about this designer is that um, purpose has kind of a double meaning because she works with communities um, that are um, uh, at risk communities, um, the homeless, um, drug recovery, all these different issues that she thinks are important to address. And she finds ways to not only uh, use uh, a sustainable model for making her clothes, but then incorporating all these other issues that she thinks are important, that th she thinks that a fashion house should address. And then these, these are some of the, the garments that, that um, she's created. And I love the, the, the sweatpants with the Tesco logo. <laughs> Very UK. And you know, um, this one is interesting, a lot of these uh, repurposed fabrics, um, you find them a lot of in accessories, like you know, repurposed canvas from billboards and things like that, um, but uh, it, not usually in clothes. And I mean, she's found a way to make it really interesting. And then, then for a runway presentation. And it, I, I will say, when I, look at, when I first look at these, you know, at my age, um, I, um, I'm looking at these clothes and seeing a certain rebelliousness and youthfulness and some unusual shapes, things that I might stay away from, um, you know, just because I'm a little bit older. But um, younger audiences are actually really adopting this, this way of dressing. And so this isn't foreign to them. This is really moving into the next generation of fashion. And then finally, um, we have Zero Waste Daniel from New York. Um, uh, Daniel Silverstein, and he, uh, I loved his story. I saw a little video of him, and one of the things that he talked about that made his transition into thinking about zero waste was he was working for a company, went into a meeting, and one of the issues that came up was waste. And um, it was a perfectly acceptable thing that a high percentage of the fabrics were, will, would go into waste. And he, he talks about actually going into the bathroom and crying because he just thought it was a crime. So he dedicated his, he did kind of a pivot in his career and dedicated it to really thinking about using every single scrap of fabric and finding a way to re, uh, redesign fabric, like reassemble it and create garments. And this is him wearing one of his pieces and I love the graphic, the David Bowie. Right? Isn't that great? And there, the great thing about this too is that there are many different versions and everyone depend, each one of them depends on the fabrics that he had for that particular one. And then they hear a couple of models wearing some variations on his pieces. Okay, so that is me. Okay, great.
Um, moving on to Michelle, could you talk to us a bit about the use of uh, reused, recycled items in high fashion? And what are some of the statements that have been made and what we can learn from this? Sure. Um, and I believe you have a PowerPoint to I share. I do, I do, I do. Yes. So, so I thought I would start with showing a few of the objects from the Museum of Fine Arts collection um, because we have been kind of more actively collecting designers who actually do a lot of this reuse and recycling. It has become such much more of a common a commonality now. So um, a lot of the work we do bring in actually uh, kind of covers the subject in an interesting way. So um, this is a bag by um, Iliara Venturini Fendi. So she is a daughter of the Fendi family in Italy. And she was working in the fashion world and then left and became an organic farmer and then came back to the fashion world um, and decided that she really wanted to give back in some way. So she became really interested in the idea of reuse and recycling and ethical sustainability. Um, so this is um, actually something she donated to the museum and um, if you can see it says save waste um, from waste. And it's really interesting. She's actually gone to Africa and she's worked with various artisans there in Cameroon as well as Nairobi um, and employed them to help um, kind of give them also um, you know, a, an occupation. Um, and this bag has, it has a lot of materials. It has Maasai fabrics, military blankets, African conga fabric, reused drawer pulls, wood, leather remnants, PVC, vintage fabric lining, and then the strap part uh, at the top is made out of old shutters. So it's really this incredible kind of combination of all of these different types of materials contained in one bag. Um, so, uh, you know, again, a little bit more of the high fashion, and I'm glad that Jay started talking about Margiela, because we do have a really nice collection of uh, Martin, uh, Martin Margiela in our in our collection, and these are three examples of really inventive reuse, also from the Artisanal collection. Um, so on your left there, that is a dress that is made from old vintage bathing suits. Um, really quite cool. Um, in the middle, that sweater is made from army socks. And he did this whole series of sweaters that are made from socks, and they're basically pieced together. And he did these in around 1991, and then around 2000, 2004, he actually published the uh, instructions on how you can make your own. So you can just purchase the army socks or whatever white socks you have. And it's this really interesting inventive use of kind of where the heel falls. So the heel falls around the shoulder, it falls around the elbow, it falls around the bust if you're making a woman's sweater. Um, but he's often playing with these really inventive materials. He's just really an amazing designer. And then that last jacket is a recent acquisition. It's from 2009. I don't know if anybody can tell what it is. Can anybody kind of take a guess? It's made out of those plastic tabs that you use to you know, put um, labels on clothing, you know, like the price tags. So those are all individual black and white tabs. I mean, really, again, quite inventive. Um, a lot of this is really more of the high end. It's not quite accessible to kind of a middle class client unless maybe you buy it on eBay or the real real or whatever. But, um, but I think he's really just a great example of using it in very kind of inventive high fashion way. So then this is work by um, Natalie Shanine. I don't know if anybody's familiar with her work, but she was a fashion designer in the fashion world in New York City, um, really successful actually, and this is dates from her time in New York, and ended up kind of giving it all up and going back to her home state of Alabama because she found, like, she found that the fashion world was pulling her away from the craft of making the textiles, and she also didn't like where the materials were coming from. She really wanted to, kind of bring back um, the craft of the creation as well as do something with her community in Alabama. So she moved back to Alabama and started um, Alabama Shanine in 2000. It's the, she started employing local women, mostly women, who already had the, the craft skills. So they could sew, they could quilt, um, and then became very involved in materials. So she actually has really helped keep um, organic <laughs> cotton mills kind of alive. Certainly she sources all of her um, cotton from Texas from one mill. Um, and what she has found is that since 2000 that there is more of a demand and so 
the processes are speeding up and it's all getting, becoming much more affordable. So she's really helping to kind of sustain this um, in an economic way. Um, her website's really fantastic. This is some of her more recent stuff from her recent collection. She does a lot of embroidery, a lot of quilting technique. Um, I have her skirt actually on today and it's um, an eBay purchase, so it is my reuse of uh, recycling of somebody else's uh, garment. Um, but she's really interested in kind of the supply chain from the actual source where the cotton is coming from through to the consumer. And she's really done this amazing job down there in Alabama. If you're ever there, it's worth a visit. There's a cafe. She's also interested in food culture. So it's this really kind of wonderful place to visit. Um, so she's a really interesting American designer who's really helping with the you know, contemporary cotton industry as well. Um, on the other side of the pond, Stella McCartney has really been at the forefront. So Paul McCartney's daughter, really at the forefront of ethical sustainability <laughs> in fashion, um, and has become this incredible mouthpiece for the subject. She doesn't use any animal products. Um, in her, she's a very big anti-fur advocate, actually. Um, so you see a bit of her mission there. Um, her website actually had for a while, I don't know if it's still up, but that uh, movie about the Bangladeshi uh, fire, the True Cost, right, that's the name of it, um, you know, which was a hideous, hideous fire in um, Bangladesh um, where many, many women, uh, many people perished um, for this industry that is supplying fast fashion. So it was a real kind of clarion call um, for this interest in reuse and recycling. Um, and then lastly, Eileen Fisher, another American designer, is, has a fascinating, fascinating uh, project that she started. Um, very successful, you probably know her work, very minimal, very simple, but she started taking back her garments from her clients. So she had this whole initiative where she said, send back your old Eileen Fishers. She then turns them into new garments. She did this amazing incubator project with um, designers through the Council of the Fashion Designers of America where she hired these young designers to then remake those garments into something new. She also has this incredible art project um, where there are three different tiers. So she takes garments in and if they're really, um, if they can be reused, she'll reuse them. Um, if they're too far gone, they then get felted into this really amazing fabric and they get turned into art objects. So she has an artist on staff who's turning them into these really kind of beautiful ethereal wall hangings and I mean it's a really, really interesting um, project I think and I'm trying to think, yeah, she said she has received over one million pieces back since 2009. So again, in this idea of um, you know, circularity, she's really taking it to this you know, very, very interesting level. And I think, yes, that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michelle. Now, uh, I have a question for Pete, but he may do a little pivot on this a bit, I think we discussed just beforehand. Um, so the formal question is, Pete, could you discuss what can be done in industrial design to incorporate used, reused materials, and what are the costs and the benefits of doing this? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I, I'm gonna take things down a level, you might say. Um, my, my role within Timberland, which is started as a small company in Newmarket, New Hampshire, in a mill, um, is a very big company now. And uh, it started in 73, here we are in 2018, and I joined 20 years ago as, I don't know, a sketch monkey, you might say, a kid fresh out of college where you got paid to draw. And that, that was wonderful. Um, but the company has grown a lot, and yet we're still tied back to the beginnings where the founder, uh, his name was Sidney Schwartz, uh, invented something, and invented something that was very much a Yankee invention, pretty much saying, what do we have here? What can we do with it? How can we be pragmatic and ingenious? And there's a story about how this came about that I won't tell now, but he created a waterproof boot. And in 1973, that was an epiphany that hadn't been done before. Uh, he worked with a tannery out of Maine called Prime Tanning, who figured out how to impregnate leather with silicone so that it would remain waterproof. 
figured out a way to put it together so things were fused together. He was way ahead of his time. Uh, when you look at that icon now, and it's, it's our icon, uh, it looks historical, it looks normal, it looks very wearable, it looks of a different time, but I think at that time it was a really radical thing. Because up to that time, people had been wearing uh, Goodyear welted leather soled work boots that uh, they worked very well, but they got very wet very quickly. And these were a very, very different thing. But soon after I joined the company, Jeffrey Swartz, uh, the son of the man who founded the company, he had a very different mission, a little bit like Stella McCartney. He was very interested in finding ways to do well and do good. And that, that's a common phrase today, but it wasn't so common. Uh, not such a, uh, a widely applied idea as it was when he began with in fact, he spent most of his time on his quarterly calls with uh, Wall Street uh, and the investors explaining how you could possibly do well and do good at the same time. Uh, smart man, and he gave room for us in design who joined Timberland because we love the outdoors uh, to do something about the outdoors. So that, that's a long way of coming around to saying they began by solving a basic problem, which was keep your feet dry on a winter day. And uh, they evolved into a fashion brand uh, almost by mistake. <laughs> they were adopted. They weren't selling to people necessarily. Uh, and eventually, though, their icon became a problem. Because if you look at that boot today, it has a sole that has been <coughs> thermoplastically fused to an upper so that it'll never come off. And it used to be made out of PVC. Uh, the leather itself, by the very nature that it's so water resistant, doesn't break down. It's, it's, it resists entropy uh, to a tremendous degree, but kind of like a shopping bag, it works really well, but it won't go away when you need it to. Um, the boot is really complicated too. If I could spread it out in front of you, you would see that there are about 65 pieces and over 50 operations to make this thing. It looks simple, but it's not anymore. It's a long way from a guy at a cobbler's bench <coughs> hand sewing a moccasin onto, say, a rubber sole. So it's a long way of coming around to something, but the, the thing that was our icon and that had a logo of a tree in a field or a stream, depending on your interpretation, was not terribly green. And I, among others, had to start figuring out, uh, because we were asked by Jeffrey to do more than volunteer in the community, but to figure out how to make a better boot, as it were, uh, for a better world. And from then to now, it's been a fascinating problem. It's, it's funny, I, I deal in style and trend and I have to think ahead several years and I have to know where people are thinking and what they're interested in. But much more of it is about solving a problem. Um, making a boot that can endure. And by endure, uh, make it up, or uh, use it up, wear it out, make do or do without is an old saying from the Depression era. Uh, how do you make something that endures and can be repaired? Um, especially in this modern day where things are made in China and things are fused together as efficiently as they possibly can. How does that square up against making something that endures, that has a second life or a third life, and actually at the end of its life can be taken apart, and those materials that it's made of, the fewer the better, can go somewhere can have a next life, can come around the circle. Uh, we've got a bit, big challenge ahead of us because while the company is keeping the lights on <laughs> through, I just got through what's called line close, which is where the final line is decided on that we're gonna sell in spring 2020. How do you satisfy the demands of the merchants who have to sales numbers, uh, who have to, they, they stick with the known because it's, frankly, they, they know they can meet their numbers, but how do you convince them to do something different, 
to do something that actually breaks the mold of saying, buy this pair of shoes and then come see us in six months and we'll sell you another pair. And that pair you bought, I don't know, good luck. Um, that's what we're involved in right now. And it's a huge challenge. Um, how do you put things together so they can come apart? How do you use just a few things so that leather can go here and say natural latex can go here and oh, aluminum from the hardware can go here? It's an incredibly tough question, but a fascinating one because it's so, if I, if I don't have any limitations on what I design, I can do anything, but I'm lost. I, I have no idea what to do. But if you say, listen, it's gonna cost this much, we have to take it apart, it has to function as well as any other shoe, it's gonna be great value, and we have to be able to make 300,000 pair in a factory in southern China. How do you do that? And that's what I'm involved in right now. It's probably the best, most interesting challenge uh, I as a designer have ever had, and it's probably gonna take me the rest of my career before I get anywhere. <laughs> so I, I really haven't answered your question, but I wanted to bring this around to the mm -hmm. idea that when you are making, I, I built a shoe that I didn't think it would succeed. It was made out of four materials, um, and it was dye washed at the end, so we only we didn't waste much fabric. We used gray goods. It was made out of natural latex rubber. There was no cement in it, and it sold over a million pair. It was I was pleasantly surprised to say the least. It means I still have a job and they haven't fired me yet. But how do you repeat that sort of thing? And how do you move beyond that to answering the problem for the consumer? I'm sure you've all had this problem where you have a pair of shoes and it's absolutely at the end of its life. You can't really leave the house wearing these things anymore or maybe the yard. And you're holding that pair of shoes over the trash can and you go, I don't know, what do I do? I guess I throw them away as much as you may recycle or anything else. So we're in the midst of trying to answer that very question. Um, it's fascinating, it's hard, it is a challenge it's how you do it. I don't believe this stuff has a future. It just ends up as microplastics or swirling around in the middle of the Pacific. So how do natural materials with all their drawbacks come in? You know, how do you talk about leather without being nailed to the wall by PETA? Um, how do you go about talking about something that's enduring? There's a million questions. So I've, I've rambled and wandered around, but I, I wanted to give you a view from, you might say, down in the trenches where we're trying to solve something like that. You know, can I get a natural latex that will biodegrade in 10 years? I think so. But I'm not sure yet. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Pete, very much. What, uh, just so you all know, the, the, the schedule from this point on, um, I'm going to ask the, our presenters if they'd like to ask you, each other questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience in about 10 minutes for your questions. Um, but I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative for just a moment. Um, because I've been very lis listening very closely and taking notes on, on all of your uh, uh, presentations. Um, and clearly we could discuss things well into the wee hours of the morning. But one of the things that when we think about historic, uh, historic fashion and what's happening currently, there's a term that was used in the 18th century called a translator. And a translator took old bits of clothes or shoes and, and remade them into something that looked new or stylish. And you don't see many accounts of translators. You don't see a whole lot of examples. I have found in, in my work a few, um, a few pieces that have been put together by translator uh, that then often found their ways to the American colonies. But a lot of this, I think, definitely fits in, and that's only one example of many, into this idea of, of, of how we reuse, recraft, and recreate. So I just want to sort of wanted to throw that out there, something that I'm picking up on. And then I'm going to ask, um, I know that Lindsay has a question for, uh, for Pete. Well, so I was reading about Apple this week, that Apple is transitioning from making products to performing services. And thinking as a historian, 
um, what Kimberly said is, you know, silversmiths, you know, I read a great account book at the Connecticut Historical Society. Silversmiths um, in the early 19th century, late 18th century, people would bring their old rings and their right. old garments. And, and the silversmith, right, could melt them down because it was an old fashioned style. And we, all, we don't think about fashion in terms of jewelry, but people brought these metal and, and the silversmith remade them into something in, in a different setting, right? Um, we as a culture have lost those skills. So the kinds of things that, it's a gendered form of labor that usually women did and some crafts people did, um, we could remake and reuse. But I'm wondering in a corporate setting, if Timberland could become a company like Apple, so that instead of thinking, okay, how do I biodegrade this material, is there a way to think about remanufacturing the shoe such that I could bring it to you and you could reshape it or remold it and ha have craftspeople who work at Timberland and perform a service. In addition to selling the products, perform that craft service, right, to solve the problem. But then my follow-up is, isn't capitalism at odds fundamentally with the longevity of goods? Thanks for putting me on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, what professors no, are I, for. Actually, actually I, I'll tell you something. Something I've been advocating at the company for several years now is that Terminal thought of as a, a noun, a thing, an object, this icon, a silhouette. And I said, you know, that's, that's kind of limiting because you're, you're stuck with however that thing is viewed in the world. The bigger idea is to be thought of as an action. Uh, and when I look around Timberland, we're a collection of people all really good at stuff. Um, and together we're an expert collective action. And I think with a particularly kind of Yankee bent around just being frugal, being smart, not boasting about it, being clever. And I'd like to think that where Timberland is going in the future is to be this kind of optimistic, clever, collective action around solving a problem you can't, which is to make a pair of shoes that you like and to keep those things going for you. Um, there's, a, there's an adage about a, a story about a New England farmer who has an ax and a friend admires it and says, wow, you've had that a long time. He, he says, yeah. yeah, I've replaced the handle twice and the, and the head once. And the point is that that original ax is no longer there, but the spirit of it, it persists in the object. And I'd like to think that the future of Timberland is to move from being a seller of things where our responsibility ends at cash wrap and instead to kind of link arms, to partner with the person about that and say, you put down good money for this and you like it and we like it too, we designed that thing and we'll help you move it along through life. Um, VF, which is short for Vanity Fair, is a parent corporation at Timberland. They own some other brands like the North Face and Vans and so forth. They, uh, the head of that, and I'm answering long, and I'll shut up in a second. Uh, the, the head of that used to be the head of North Face, and he has decided, and he's boldly stated it in public, publicly stated goals that VF is gonna move to a circular business model in the next 10 years. I don't know how we're gonna get there, but that's a radical way of thinking, which means you're gonna take responsibility for what happens in that thing after its useful life is over, which suggests we're an action, or a service. So the question of the conundrum around like we're in the business of selling things, I think like Apple, or like a lot of companies, yes, we'll sell things, but our bigger function will be that we'll be a service in helping you kind of go through life with that thing. Uh, that, that sounds generalized, but I think you know what I mean. So I, I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you. Do any of you have questions for one another before we open to the floor? I have, I have one, um, actually, with Jay, because he, you're in the thick of the design school and I, um, you know, uh, environment. And I, I keep thinking that I'm seeing more and more programs, you know, that are actually dealing with this, like sustainability as part of the curriculum. And is that something that you're seeing more of? 
um, generally or def uh, yeah, yeah. You're definitely seeing that pop up at schools as a separate kind of almost feel like specialization. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I mean, I, and I think that's great. I think that needs to be a part of everything so that you can have the, the kind of information that, that someone needs to specialize in that. But I think uh, kind of what I, what I was getting to with the slides that it's, it's, it's just much more important to change the thinking only because even if you're doing evening gowns and you're not thinking about repurposing or like you were mentioning about the, the, the uh, the, the lifespan of a garment, like with Patagonia, they have like um, uh, kits to, to repair. They have videos mm -hmm. of how to repair. And that appeals to kind of this new generation that loves the DIY okay. and customization yes. and making it your own. Mm -hmm. So it's appealing to that make do and mend mentality in a whole different way than it did during the war. So um, I think it's really about saying, um, like giving them the whys and not, not just the big obviously really important reasons, the planets, you know, for one, but thinking about the why in a design process way. Like, why do you want to do this? Because like you're saying, this is the, the big challenge of your career. It's like, that sh should be the exciting part. Like that, not just making a pretty garment and, and selling it, but changing the thinking, but definitely including it as a part of the conversation. I recently worked with um, the disabled community and I learned so much about that process and they wanted to know oh are there programs that we can have at the school for that and it was the same issue it was like um, we didn't necessarily have the resources at, at our school to create a whole separate program for that but again it had to be incorporated into the thinking you know that 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 user that any kind of disability can actually spawn really great design ideas like really clever ideas like the like the back zipper of um, a wetsuit you know, with that pull that you pull pull it up with, um, so that you you can actually pull up a zipper in the back. Why couldn't that be in a dress? You know, why couldn't that be a design to like a beautiful jeweled little chain that you pull and then it becomes part of the dress? So you know, because that's an issue. I mean, first of all, why are the zippers in the back anyway? But um, but the, the whole idea of making it part like a creative challenge rather than making it this whole other school of study because. There are some people who are enamored of the fantasy of fashion, you know, and the glamour and the, fan, you know, the, the excitement of it all. So I think it's about the changing of the thinking. I, but it's important to get them while they're in school because otherwise, kind of habits kind of die hard, you know, once you get started. So. Yeah. There does seem to be a lot more of an awareness, certainly oh, with yeah. the younger generation. I mean, yeah, they're they bringing it to us. They're much on board, right? And right. they're pushing, pushing the envelope, I think, in many ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. I, I think we have an eager audience with some great questions. So uh, why don't we go ahead and open it up for questions for our speakers. Sorry, thank you. But it's also the issues of transportation, you know, all the other environmental expenses in remaking something, and you've got to consider those too, you know, getting something from here to there and, and the labor and the employment and, you know, not, not just the item itself. Well, and the, the environmental resources that go into the textiles themselves. So it, it's an enormous investment in water to produce cotton. Um, polyester um, is a, uh, greenhouse gas fabric, right? It uses petroleum products, right? So uh, absolutely, I mean, we need to divest ourselves, everybody divest yourself of, of polyester. <laughs> I mean, just as a rule, really. <laughs> um, but, you know, we think cotton is natural is a natural fiber, and so when we think eco, we want to move in the cotton linen direction. We think of them as natural, but they are an enormous resource that they're taxing on the planet. You're right. Uh, one point, uh, just on something you said about capitalism, and it was King Gillette who actually came up with the idea of having razor blades that didn't last very long uh, before that. But my question was, nobody had mentioned um, what I would consider to be a traditional New England way of uh, reuse, and that is, there was an, I believe they're still around, it was called Keezers, a traditional Harvard Square institution for a uh, gentleman who came with a nice tweed jacket and when they needed some beer money would, you know, sit, take it over to Keezer's and it was recycled in that fashion and a lot of people got their tuxes there and so on. Um, a lot of what you were describing, 
uh, is sort of chic and fancy and not really very affordable to most people. Um, the, the woman from the MFA I know was wearing the eBay skirt, she had said, but I was wondering if somebody could just comment a bit, oh, no, and also on the area of shoes. Uh, uh, what you were saying about services, obviously a lot of shoes nowadays are not made in a way that really per permits a cobbler to, um, to do what traditionally could have been done where you would get heels and soles put on. Um, I, I may. Um, so one of the issues today that is really very much a part of the conversation is the idea of fast fashion. And I don't know if everybody is aware of what that phrase means, but essentially it is when you see what's coming down the runway, for example, which is still you know, setting a lot of the style, so all of these high-end designers, and then it gets turned over and immediately turned into accessible fashion at places like Zara and H&M. Incredibly cheap, actually. It's very, very affordable and accessible to everybody, and yet it is perceived as disposable. I mean, like the pace of the fashion cycle has sped up to such a degree now that people don't even hold on to it long enough to repair it. And the quality isn't that great either, so it's not really worth repairing. So that's a huge issue. Um, you know, in the MFA, a lot of our historic garments are, I'd say 40% of them have been remade in some way, shape, or fashion. That's very typical for museum collections because the textile was so costly, it was so valued, and so it, then we get remade. I don't think we're in that moment right now. I think there's more of an awareness, and I think there is a movement toward people thinking about getting fewer high quality products but when you look at kind of mass consumption, it is this fast fashion, and that's what people are, and so it, it isn't even really worth, right? Yeah, and, and, <laughs> so, and, and to speak yeah. to the Keezers, because I used to, when I first moved to Boston, I was a customer, um, and I loved it, because you could find these great finds, but um, the secondhand and sort of vintage market has changed dramatically, because yes. it used to be that you could shop and find something for a great price. Now, a savvy, you know, a uh, shop will be able to see, you know, is that a label? Is that how is that made? And and the value it it's no long it's it, a lot of it is cost prohibitive now. So even if you're shopping on eBay to find something that's uh, a label that you want or a certain quality, like a nice tweed jacket, like you mentioned, um, they understand the value of that, uh, mainly because it was made so well. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's changed dramatically because uh, you can't just go, even to secondhand shops, you know, it's either all t-shirts and jeans or, or it's higher end stuff and, and they know the difference and they price it accordingly. Yeah, I've seen kind of the bottom fall out of the vintage market because I've been buying vintage and consignment for a mm -hmm. long, long time. And just within the last five years, you cannot find much of anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is the internet too. I mean, right. uh, websites like Etsy, that's the clearinghouse for a lot of this material, and they find they can make more money that way, so that's where people are shopping. But I would say that there are organizations, um, certainly on college campuses, and there are um, NGOs and nonprofits moving into that space, so I know our students who need suits to interview or who need formal wear, so there's a lot of um, community organizations that do gather a sort of um, professional attire for young people as well as prom dresses and such. So there, there definitely is some recycling and reusing in that space for um, you know, that demographic, but it's, it's quite small scale. Right. And Dress for Success is yes. another great example great. Yeah. of professional clothing that gets donated and then kind of sourced out to people who are really in need and it's good quality. And it's in, that's a national organization. National, it's yeah. in a lot of places yeah. and it's quite substantive. It's very, yeah, it's doing very well. I'm just going to um, mention something. This is not something you all should try, but um, a well-known Boston couple who will remain unnamed talked about the original idea of uh, how you pick up a better trench coat. You go to whatever, whoever's having a, a reception, knowing that they're all tan trench coats. You look at one that's better than the one you had, you pick it up and you leave and no one knows the difference. But I don't encourage that behavior. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder if any of you in the art spaces or even outside of the art spaces are hearing about the visible mending movement. So beyond recycling fashion, beyond remaking fashion, um, often building off, I think it's the Japanese embroidery, sashiko, 
I think is what it's called, if you're seeing that coming along as well. Well, there was recently an exhibit at the, the Gardner Museum, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, oh my gosh, uh, Lee Ming Wei? Lee Ming Wei. Oh, yes. good, I got it right. Um, and uh, the exhibit was all about that, about um, uh, guests uh, uh, came in to actually do mending. And one of the beautiful things was I, I got to do it one of the days, and it was really fascinating because uh, his idea was all about the stories that came with why they wanted that garment mended. And um, so our goal was to kind of engage in conversation with that person, take a little inspiration, and really make the mend a part of the, uh, of the beauty of the garment. Kind of like Kintsugi, the Japanese, where a broken pot will be mended, but then gold or silver will be put on, you know, to accentuate the life and history of that particular garment. So I think when you see things like that at a major institution, uh, you know, uh, for, for a good length of time and involving so many people, um, I think people uh, really get excited about the idea of sharing their stories and then being able to wear that t-shirt with that mending on it or that little scarf and uh, it has this history, it's a conversation, it isn't just a garment anymore. Uh, no, no I, I did the mending. Um, yeah, I mended several things, yeah. <laughs> it was, a, and the stories were great. They were really fun. Um, oh, uh, let's see, oh, one of the strange and wonderful, um, this gentleman brought this t-shirt and it was a white t-shirt but it looked very, very old. <laughs> And he actually, you know, he said, it's washed, I promise, because it, it was very stained with dirt, and it was his gardening shirt. And he, t he, told, he told me this incredible story. He was gardening one day, and he tripped and he fell, and um, somehow there was this rod sticking out of the ground. Um, it just it, 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 uh, bypassed him, caught the T-shirt, created this rip, which was a three-way rip, and um, he was fine but it could have just gone right through his throat. Like he was very, like, you know, he, tell, he told it with great passion. And so uh, I started, I got I'm very inspired, a little emotional, because it was really kind of dramatic even though it happened to him a while back, but he never let go of the t-shirt. Like he had mm. saved that t-shirt. To him it was this safe, you know, lucky t-shirt because it saved his life. And, um, and so I started to do, because of the three ways, it was a little dark, but we kind of agreed upon it. I kind of went for that Y incision that they do, you know, autopsies, just because I thought scar. A little dark, yes, I agree. Um, but it was, but we did it in colors, so it was pretty. Um, but it was more this idea, it was like this healing thing, like we're putting this back together and yeah. it's a scar of life and that kind of thing. And he, he seemed to like it, so it was fun. I have a question to the moderator. I remember from the previous presentation that the, red, the, the green dress upstairs yes. is also redone. And I'm just curious about the process, how you uh, investigate the historical garments, uh, how you find about how they were recycled or redone. Is that something about like older fabric and new technology or new technique of remaking it? And just about the process of investigation. Uh, it's a deep emerald green Spitafields dress that was originally worn for a wedding here in Boston in 18, oh, 1747. It was subsequently updated uh, from what we can tell at least two, pro possibly three times. Um, how did we know that? This, this is where style becomes part of the discussion and Michelle and, and Lindsay have also uh, talked about this, but the textile had so much value even in the 19th century that it was worth remaking this dress. And there was not this fear that somehow the fabric was already a hun almost 100 years old, but it, it really carried its, uh, if, you, if you see it in the gallery, First of all, the silk is of such a quality, you, you couldn't find that made today. It's, it would be prohibitive. Um, so the, the quality of the silk was excellent. Somebody was obviously very happy to remake it. The bodice has been uh, fitted out for about 1830s or 40s. Um, I have to confess it's a really lousy job. It looks like I could have done it. They, obviously somebody was getting ready for a fancy dress party you know, and wanted to make something that looked nice but didn't quite uh, have all the parts. So, and how did we know that? Um, through style, 
through what would have been worn at the time that we know the original wearer wore it. And also, one of the most fun things, and I know you all can agree with me, is when you look at things from inside out, you know, and you get to see the hands of the different people who've worked, particularly in this pre-sewing machine era, um, who've recrafted, remade, rehemmed. Some of them are amazing at their stitches. Some are just doing something incredibly quick that your home ec teacher would have hated. You know, so, um, so that's... There, there, in, in this, no, not that we saw, no. Um, but r lots of large running stitches and things like that, you know, whip stitching. Um, so so it's, all part of, it's all part of that, uh, you know, that search. And I'm sure you could have the same garment and have all of us address it, and we'd all have something different to say about it. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists tonight. Thank you all for coming. And as always, thanks uh, to MHS and the fabulous staff here who make these programs possible. Good night.